If you have your Bibles, why don't you go ahead and grab them. Um, we're going to be looking in 1 John chapter 4. That's where we're going to be tonight. And we're going to jump around a little bit, uh, but that's going to be our main text. Uh, if you don't have a Bible in your hand, you're missing out. If you don't, if you don't have one with you, uh, there's plenty of Bibles all around you. There's yellow ones, there's orange ones. They're similar, okay? Uh, the, 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 the verses that I want you to read, they'll be up on the screen, okay? And uh, we're going to use uh, some common cultural language here when it comes to the page numbers. You know, when you, and, and this is a bad testimony on today's world, but you know, you tell someone you're going to be somewhere at a certain time, it has now changed to, I'll be there at five-ish. You know what I'm talking about, right? That's, that's popular now, right? Okay, so these Bibles that you see here, they're, they're, they're the same Bible, but there's a couple different runs. And so it, the, up on the pay on the screen, like that right there, that's 849-ish. Okay, that's 849-ish because of the same thing. But listen, it's going to get you to within a page-ish. Okay, so just grab one of these things, open it up and read it. Okay, here, I know you want to read it. I'm all over you, okay? All right, all over you. So go ahead and read that. If you have your own Bible, awesome. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank um, Pastor Steve Yates for coming last week. He's an awesome friend of mine. I did meet him in Home Depot, and it was a great meeting. And he's like, hey, aren't you the dude that had to sign up? And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we became really close friends. We meet together. We talk. Um, we, we pray together. We plan together. He's a good dude. I appreciate him coming, and I appreciate his message. It was, uh, I think, well-received by everybody. And I certainly want to take a moment to, uh, to thank all of you. Several of you have uh, taken the time out of your busy schedules to let me know that you love me and that you appreciate me, and I certainly want to thank you for that. It, it, it was not, uh, it's, not a, it's not a small deal. I do thank you for that, so I appreciate it. Anyway, um, before we jump into John chapter, uh, 1 John chapter 4, I just want to say this. The, the last couple of weeks, we, we've been preaching uh, this series called We the People, and I'm just trying to lay before you what this church is, where it's going, where it's been. Uh, the first couple of weeks, just kind of talking to you about maybe uh, that the church 
is more than just getting together here on a Saturday night or on a Sunday morning and just pray, preach, sing, go home. That maybe it's more than that. So I kind of deconstructed church the first week. And then the second week, I try to lay before you some ideas and some possibilities of what the church could be more than it is now. Remember I had the, the easel out with the piece of paper and I was asking you all what you thought, what are you dreaming of, what could this church be more than it is now, some dreams that God has laid on your heart. You know what I'm saying? So we listed it down. Now out of all that comes this, uh, this vision statement, I think, and it's very, it's pregnant with, with truth, and it's pregnant with purpose, and that is this, and I, I hope we can get it up on the screen, okay? We've come up with this, and I think this is just going to be the words, I, I would love for you to, to write this down and, and make it your own, because if someone says, what is your church all about, this could be something you could tell them, and it's, like I said, it's pregnant with, with truth and purpose, and this is what it is. Revolution Church is a gospel center, that's the first thing. Okay, gospel center. That means everything we do, the reason why our existence is based on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because we didn't love him, we didn't ask for it, we didn't earn it, but he loves us and he's given us salvation, forgiveness, and love and this church. And that's the reason why the church exists and that's what will propel us and give us energy and purpose moving forward, everything we do. Gospel centered, culture creating community, bringing beauty to the world. Now, I want to focus a little bit on this, this end, this bringing beauty to the world. What that means is that all this other stuff in advance of those words, you, you come up with stuff, right? God gives you ideas and you put things together and then you take this stuff and you actually bring it out to the world so they can see Jesus. That's the whole purpose of our church. And so what I wanted to do tonight is I wanted to think about that. What is it that we are creating and bringing to this world. What are we creating and bringing to this world? So now, 1 John chapter 4. Now listen, there's lots of things that we could bring to this world. There's lots of things we can bring to this world, and we're going to study one of them tonight. But there's lots of things we can bring to this world. Let me, let me offer you some things before we jump into the text, okay? We can offer, the, I think, the most beautiful thing, and that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The scriptures say that if you have been told the gospel, if you know the gospel, you've been given a sacred trust, this amazing story of this incredible creator who loves you and he created you to be like him and we rebel against him and none of us love him, none of us are seeking after him, no one does right, no one is righteous, we don't deserve it, we we have an ask for his love, his forgiveness, his salvation, nothing, you've learned nothing, but yet this God loves you so much that he gives his son to lay down his life that you might have life. That's an amazing thing of beauty, and that is the first thing we should bring to the world, no doubt, okay? That was a good place for an amen, but I'll give, you can redeem yourself later. All right, cool. Now here's another thing we could do. We've got spiritual gifts. The scriptures say that this God that loves you gave you all gifts. Some of us will speak in tongues. Some of us will interpret. Some of us will just help people. Some of us are radically hospitable. Some of us have amazing faith. There's all these different gifts, right? And so we're supposed to take those gifts and use them for his glory, right? So that's another, th another thing of beauty that we could bring to the world. And there's another thing, too. And it's not the spiritual gifting, but there's this, just these innate talents. Some of us are just extremely talented. I am not. But some of us are extremely talented. And so let, let me just, for instance, uh, a guy who is in the NBA, and he's 7'2", and he goes down the court, and he dunks the ball, and he beats on his chest and goes, Ooh, me! Right? Really? W did you plan on being 7'2"? Did you have anything to do with being 7'2"? Were you there when mom and dad said, hey, baby? Right? You weren't there. You had nothing to do with it. Right? So really, who gave you that 7'2"? Can you tell me? Right. So that's a talent to be used for the Lord. Anything that we do can be used for the Lord. See, the scriptures say that whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So we can, we can be a basketball player for the glory of God. Like, like Mr. Tebow, like you might not be all Gator fans, but you should be, right, Jimmy? Right? I'm just saying, I'm not, a I'm not a football fan, but, you know, Jimmy gave me 50 bucks to say that, and I'm, I'm hurting right now, so, you know, I'm working on it. I'm just kidding. Uh, but if Seminole fans, it's 75. So, uh, <laughs> listen, and I'm just, I'm just saying, like, 
like he, he may not have made it as big as like Tom Brady or something, but, but he's used his gift, right? He's got a talent. He's a football player. He's an enormous, he is not a quarterback, right? He's a linebacker. The guy's massive, right? Ever, he's like an oak tree, this dude, right? Did he have anything to do with that? What, did, did, did mom and dad sprinkle fairy dust on him and say, I want to make this guy a giant, and right? He had nothing to do with it. But he uses his talent that he had nothing to do with for the glory of God. He uses his talent to share the gospel of Jesus. He puts his little John 3, 16. That's pretty cool, right? That was creative. That's what I'm talking about, y'all. Creative, right? So he does this all for the glory of God. And we're supposed to do that as well. Any talent that you have, do it all to bring glory to God. Now, here's the other thing that's made the list. And it's kind of a sad commentary on today's world. This is so sad, but in this world where divorce is 50%, right? 50% divorce rate, and in the church, it's nearly the same number. Almost 50% within the church. Uh, a third of the children that are born in this country right now will grow up in a home without their natural dad, without their biological father, right? I know recently of a couple perfectly good on the outside 17 years two kids job house i don't love you anymore it's rampant right we need to know what real love is and one of the things that we can bring to this world is an authentic expression of love that's the gift that we need to bring to the world the christian church needs to lead by example so let's read our text tonight first john chapter four who's in favor of learning what real love is come on all right here we go you ready to read we're going to read like um i don't know half a column or so Y'all cool with that? All right, pay, up, pay attention. It's God's word, all right, Jared? <laughs> Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. And God has given us his spirit as proof that we live in him and he in us. Furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now testify that the Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. All who confess that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them, and they live in God. We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is, fear, it is for fear of punishment, and this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. We love because he loved us first. If someone says, I love God, but hates a Christian brother or sister, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? And he has given us this command. Though, this is a command, y'all. Those who love God must, say must, must also love their Christian brothers and sisters. All right, so here's the first thing. Here's the thing that we could bring to this world. Okay, can you bring up the house at all? It's way dark. It's, it's driving me insane. Okay, thank you. Here's the thing that we, we can bring to the world that the world absolutely needs. And like I said, it's a sad commentary on today's culture that this is even on the list, but that Christians love other Christians. Christians, lo Christ followers, loving other Christ followers. You see, the scriptures call Christianity, way back when in the book of Acts, uh, the way. And here's a new way that the world is dying to see. They want to see Christ followers loving Christ followers. You see it there in the text. Look at verse 7 and 8. And I love this. In this, in this uh, translation, the New Living, it says something a little bit different than some of the other translations. It says, dear friends, let us continue to love one another. 
But see, most translations just say, let us love one another. So if you picked it up yesterday and it said, love one another, when should you love them? Right then and there, right that day. So if you pick it up today, it says love, and you should love that day. If you pick it up next week or next month or next year and you read it, it says you should love one another, right? But what happens if someone only picks this thing up once? That's why I love it. It says that if you pick it up today, you're supposed to love today, and you're supposed to continue to love as you move forward. So the text tells us we're to love one another, for love comes from God. I know this is kind of free for y'all right now, but his love never ends, and so ours shouldn't either, right? Amen. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. You know, they say that John was this, gospel, this, uh, this uh, disciple of love, right? He's a hammer, because he's telling us whether we're Christians or not right here and now. He's, he's really calling us out. He says, if you love, then you're a Christian. If you're really not loving, then you're really not. You need to check yourself, right? Now listen, I want to talk about this love. This love here, I, I looked it up in the context. It's used all over, just over and over and over again in this section of Scripture, right? This love that Jesus is telling us here we should love each other, right? This is the agape love. This is, and it's um, in the concordance, if you look it up, there's actually two loves used here, but it's number 25 and number 26. They're almost exactly the same. They have the same root. This is the love that everyone talks about, that it's God's unconditional love. Ever, ever hear anybody teach that? The agape love is God's unconditional love? Listen, I, I'm not saying that that's not what it is. Right? I'm just saying when you look it up in the concordance, it doesn't say that. I'm not saying that it isn't. It just doesn't say that. But you know what it says? I love this. It says it's the love feast. It's a love feast, right? It's not like a, it's not like a, a, a happy meal, y'all. It's not like the, the dollar menu. It's like the smorgasbord, right? He's pouring it out on you. It's like, it's like it's a, the golden corral of love, right? Endless downpour of love, just showering love and love. Like, and if you know God, you know that's exactly what he's like, right? Just constantly, every day, your sunrise, your sunset, the storm when you need it, right? Your kids loving you, a husband that comes with just the right time, endless love, love. Love, 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 love. And that's what he wants us to do. Just constantly love feast all over each other. Not just, hey, I love him. Not just, oh, I love him. It's more than words. He wants you to be part of a love feast. Well, that's not normal, is it? You guys say that that's the normal? You guys live. Most of us have been living in this earth for quite a while. You go through the streets and you go to work and all that, even to your own house. Is that the way it is? The love feast, right? Who, could, who can honestly say that they live a life where everyone's just in this love feast all the time? Nobody, right? It's not normal. You know why he talks about it in the Bible? Because it ain't normal, right? That's why I, all the stuff's in the Bible, because it ain't normal. But listen, things happen. Things happen. When, you, when a true conversion experience takes place. Things happen when you regenerate. Things happen when you have a rebirth, right? The scriptures say in 2 uh, Corinthians 5, 17, for if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has died. Behold, I see, I notice. Take notice of this. He's different. Behold, it's a new man. And so when he says there should be a love feast, we're capable of it. You see what I'm saying? When you've died and you've become a new person, you're capable of the love feast, pouring out love all the time, never ending. Why? Because it's from God. And God never stops pouring his love into you, so you have an endless supply of love to give way more than you think you do, myself included. Pray for me. All of us do. Listen, things happen when there's a true conversion. The scriptures tell us that we, get, we receive a new heart. We receive a new nature. We receive a new mind. The scriptures say you have the mind of Christ. You can start thinking like Jesus, y'all. You know what I'm saying? You can start thinking like him. You can start feeling like him. You have a new nature. You don't have to act the way you did before. You can act like him. It says in Ephesians 1.13, that the moment you bend your knee to him, he has given you a new spirit. Right? The Holy Spirit is, is put on you. He has marked you and you are his. You have a new mind, a new heart, a new nature, and you have a new identity. Listen, we all know this by experience and we know it by the scriptures. The scriptures say that we are, before Christ, you are an enemy of God because of your evil thoughts and actions. Raise your hand, right? Oh, come on. 
All of us. But when you're a new creation, behold, a new man. You have a new identity. You're no longer an enemy of God. You're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. You're an ambassador of God. You're a co-heir with Jesus to the glory of God. That's who you are. That's a new person. You're a new person. And listen, I want to dispel some, 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 some phony belief systems in here. The Bible also says when you're in Christ, you're a friend of God. Y'all know that? I am a friend of God. Y'all know the song. Don't make me sing it. I'll ruin it. I ain't no Israel Houghton. Yo, I will ruin the song. Y'all know the song, right? Say, say you do or I'm going to sing it. He calls me friend. Come on. We're, right. He, we're a friend of God, right? Listen, 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 listen. How many people in here have friends? Raise your hand. Do you like them? You do. No, 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 no. Seriously, Jimmy. Right? You wouldn't be friends. You would, what'd you say? Otherwise, they wouldn't be friends. Right. Now, listen, 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 listen. The Bible says we're to love people, but we don't have to like them. Oh, you are so wrong. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. There is zero, zero, say zero. There is zero room in that Bible for that theory. There is zero room in that Bible for that theory. We are supposed to be like Jesus, right? You are a friend of God. That means he likes you. You have no right to say you love someone and don't like them. Do you understand that? Because when you do that, you know what you've done? You've made love your thought, your feeling, and just truth, but you are not living it. That's what that is. You have to love, you have to like. They go hand in hand. Let me just tell you, let me read you something, okay? This is, what it, this is the definition of like. Got to learn something here, man. I love doing this. There ain't no drug like this, brother. <laughs> Where is it? Come on now. Where's my definition of love? Of like, no, of like. You ready? To find agreeable, enjoyable, or satisfactory to be fond of, be attached to, have a soft spot for, have a liking for, have regard for, think well of. Here's some synonyms. Admire, respect, esteem. Let me ask you a question. What is the antonym? You know, that's the opposite, right? What's the antonym of love? Be honest. Yeah? If I could blow up the screen, you're gonna screen that you're gonna find the antonym to like is hate. You just walked into it. You preach. Boom. That's the antonym of like, is to hate. There's zero room to say, I love, but I don't like. There's zero room for it. Okay, it's not simply a thought. It's not simply a feeling to love someone. It's not something that's just an emotion or just a truth. It's to be lived out. And the second point I want to bring to you tonight is not only are Christians supposed to love each other, but love is active. Love is active. It is not just melted down into this thought or this, this word that says, oh, I love you, but we're just not doing coffee together. I love you, but we're not going to hang out. I love you, but don't ask me to change your tire. I love you, I just don't like you. It's common, and it needs to stop. And, and you're going to see why in just a minute. But let me tell you something. Love is active. Love is active. You're going to see it there in the text. Look back at the text. Look at verses uh, uh, 9 and 10. You there? God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Love is active. He loved us and he sent. Do you see that? They're, they're not, you cannot separate the two. He shows his love by action. Love is always an action. It's not just a thought or a feeling or an emotion. It's an action, okay? Love is not static, y'all. It moves. It doesn't sit still. 
Okay, and this, listen, under the, you all agree that this is perfect, right? This is God's word. Are we all at least in agreement there? You just say yes even if you don't believe it because otherwise we'll stone you. Okay, listen, you can fake it. You can fake it. Okay, this is, this is, this is the inspired word of God, right? The Holy Spirit says, yo, I want you to pick up a pen and I want you to write this, right? So these guys write it. So First John, right, in this book we just read that it's active. He sends, he sends, he sends, right? Under the same inspiration of the same Spirit, the same Spirit says to Paul, the Apostle Paul, Romans 5, 8, listen to this similar verbiage. God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Action, right? That's an action, 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, if you're there, you can look at it. It just says this, loving God means keeping his commandments. Again, what is it? Action, say it. It's an action, right? It's an action. That same idea exists in the book of James. James discusses this. It's an action in James chapter 2. Go there. Jared. Jared. James chapter 2, 14 through 16. Listen, love's in action, right? Love's in action. The same idea discussed by this man here, James, okay? Chapter 2, verse 14. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your, what? Actions. What, can that kind of faith save anyone? Here's an example. So I love, I love, you know, he's telling us something, but he gives us an example, some application. Suppose you see a brother or sister, so suppose you see another Christian who has no food or clothing, and you say, goodbye, have a good day, stay warm and eat, or in our vernacular these days, I'll pray for you. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? What good does that do? So, Again, action. Love is an action. Look back in 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. Verse 17. Similar thing. God must be trying to say something to us. If someone has enough money to live well, and I would venture to say that most people in this country, even though you're poor, we do, and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Let me just shine some light on the word compassion. The, com the word compassion, has a, it's a double meaning. It says that you actually feel, if you can look this up, you can, and this is what this is, they attribute compassion to Jesus, that you actually feel the pain that someone else is carrying, Right? You feel the pain that they're carrying and you are, you are, you are, you are, you are um, inspired by that pain to actually take action, that's our word for the night, to take action to alleviate the pain. That's compassion. So it's not just, oh, I love you, I'll pray for you, but actually motivates you to actually step into that, driven by the power of the gospel that you didn't deserve, but God stepped into your life, and you do likewise. You step into that problem, and you bring help to that situation. That's Jesus, and that is action, okay? Remember this, 2 Corinthians ch chapter 5, verse 17, I said this, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has died who lived for themselves and didn't take action. Behold, I see, I notice, that's a new person, and you can do this. You're part of the love feast, okay? Now listen. Love must be redefined. You know, the scriptures say that we're to be, we're not supposed to copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let God change the way you think. And so we need to change the way we think about love, okay? Love defined uh, in the scriptures is way different than love described in America, okay? It's totally different. I want to I want to go over this with you because I want you to see that to love somebody is not just to go buy them roses or presents. And that's common. We see it displayed in Christmas time. The more you love, the more presents you give somebody. But that's not biblical. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 
These are the love verses. I wanted to put, I should have put that up, man. Y'all remember the brother love from wrestling? I know that Vernon does. Guy comes out in a white suit. His face is all bright red. His blood pressure is pumping through the, his face. And he comes out and he's like, I love you. And he says, I love you. And then he goes behind the person's back and he smashes them over the head with a chair. That's us. That's us. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 4 through 7. Y'all there? You there? You'd have it memorized anyway, I know. And I just want to go on record of saying that, that Jared practices what I'm about to read to you daily and wonderfully. Amen. <laughs> you ready? Love is patient. We already know he lied. Right there. Boom. No. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. <laughs> it is not irritable. And it keeps no record of being wronged. Listen, y'all. Listen, listen, listen. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Here's one word, active. Do you notice every, if you go back into this list, every single one of these things is an action. Even if you choose not to be rude, you're choosing to do something, aren't you? Every single thing on this list, being patient, being kind, not being irritable, is not just standing still. You're choosing to do something. I'm going to be nice instead of rude. There's the choice. Every single one of these things on this, th on this list is an action. Love is never described as a feeling in the Bible. It's never. It's always an action. It's active. I'm choosing. I'm engaging. Okay, I'm doing something. Love is an action. All right, now let's go back to our text for the third thing. The third thing I'm going to offer you this. I'm going to tell you that I believe with all my heart from reading this thing that authentic, biblically defined love is best lived out in community. Right here, the body of Christ, living life together. Okay, let's go to verse 11 in our, in our text here in 1 John. What's it say? Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God but if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is brought to full expression in us. Now, a little bit ago, you all agreed that this is God's word, and that there's no mistakes, right? You get this, right? It's real? It's right? Okay, so, so the choice of wording is correct. It's not a mistake, correct? You get this. Okay, now, did you notice here in the text, it's, there's, there's no more I, it's us. It's we. Look at the text. Look what he says. He, he, he could have said, but if we love each other, God lives in you. He could have said that, right? He said, he lives in you. And, and his love is brought to full expression in you. But he didn't. He said in us. He said in us. And listen, this is not just some isolated situation in Scripture. I believe that it's supported by Scripture. I think that the best way for Jesus to be seen and expressed to a lost and hurting world is in community, us together, us together. John 13, 35, this is Jesus talking, so you should listen up. He says this, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Listen, uh, it's your love for one another will show me to the world. That's what he's saying. Because he said you'll be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. When they see you, they'll see me. So when, they, when you come a-walking into town, he wants us to show him. We want to show him. We want to reflect him. And the best way for us to do that is when people walk into that church and they see the way we love one another, whether it's in this gathering, in your house, in a small group, at the bowling alley, it doesn't make a difference. When they see how you love one another together, that's the best expression of Jesus to the world. Thank you. That was half-hearted. Let me hear it. All right, that's what I'm talking about, okay? I need to hear that stuff. I need to hear that stuff. Okay, all of us together. Now listen, many of you have probably heard this before. I've said this before, but let me repeat it because it's that laughable. I will come to your church when you walk on water. Has anyone ever said that to you? You invite them to church? 
Oh, I'll come to church when you walk on water. Right? You, have, you never heard that? I have. Many times. Any other stupid things that people tell you when you, hey, I'll come to your church if? Anyone want to offer one up? I've, huh? What's that? Okay. What else? If what? Someone called my, uh, not my, the church line the other day. And, and Meredith answered the phone and the guy says, I got the hiccups, I need you to make them go away. <laughs> he dropped a few F-bombs and hung up. It was awesome. It was awesome. Anyone want to take over the phone? Okay, I didn't think so. No takers, yeah. People say all the time, I've heard it several times, listen, when y'all walk on water, I'll come to your church. Listen, that's, that's worldly thinking. That's worldly thinking. People think they, they're going to impose this thing upon the church. If you'll do this, then I'll come. See, people have this false, this is human thinking, okay? This is not godly thinking. This is people saying, if you'll do this, if God will do this, then I'll come. But let me tell you something. This is the truth, this word, right? This word's the truth. And this is what it says. If you want to see me, the best way for that to be expressed, the love of God, the best expression, the most full expression of God's love to this world is not tongues, it's not healings, it's not prophecy, it's not walking on water, it's not hospitality, it's not, it is fully expressed by the way we love one another. When you walk out there and you see that sunset and you're like, wow. I mean, we see it all the time, right? It's crazy beautiful. And they like, wow. Yo, that's the handprint of God. That's, he's, look, he's got the brush in his hand. Oh, well, that may be true. But it's the greatest expression, the way that the world will see Jesus more so than a, than a sunset, is when they walk into a, to a church gathering and they see the way we love one another, they should be going, wow. I can't believe that. What, you needed a kidney and he gave it to you? You needed a car payment and he paid it for you? You needed someone to watch your kids so you go on a date night and they watch them for you? Who does this? You're all crazy. You're darn right we are. <laughs> they, 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 the world is starving for the, a, an authentic expression of love that doesn't just say, I don't love you anymore. I mean, I came home to that. I'm, just, I'm not ripping anybody. I came home to that, my ex-wife. Where is she? Got her boyfriends. I don't love you anymore. What? I've been there. It's crazy. This is what happens. That's not real love. The world is dying to see real love. And the best way for Jesus' love to be expressed to a dying and hurting world is in community. Us, Jesus fully expressed by loving each other. Look, Christianity is, is always a shared experience. It is never to be lived alone. Just here in this text here, this, this, uh, this guy, John, he's got his buddies. They're doing their ministry thing. But if you look at the beginning of the, of the book, right here at the end of the first paragraph, it gives us this idea too that it's always supposed to be together. That this thing's supposed to be lived out together. Look here, it says, um, in verse two of the first chapter, says, this one who is life itself was revealed to us. So they like hung out with Jesus. They, they listened to his teaching. They saw him crucified. They saw him raised from the dead. And we have seen him. And, and they didn't just hog it to themselves, right? Look what it says. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father and then he was revealed to us. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that you may fully share our joy. Okay, Christ's church is to be lived together. The full expression of God's love to the earth is the church loving on each other together all the time. Galatians chapter 6, it says, share each other's burdens. James chapter 5, pray for one another. 1 Thessalonians 5, encourage one another. Hebrews chapter 10, motivate one another. It's always for each other. We're supposed to love on each other. It's the love feast, y'all. That's what we're supposed to be doing all the time. It's not a one-time thing. Sharing each other's burdens. 
Who needs something done? Raise your hand and then we all jump in and help each other. Who needs their kids watched for a date night? Who is starving to take their wife out on a date and can't because they need someone to watch the kids? Who's going to watch their kids for them? That's what, bam, that's a love feast right there, right? We're supposed to share each other's burdens. We're supposed to pray for one another every single day, not once, always. It's active. Love is active. We're supposed to encourage one another. Why do you think we're supposed to come here? To listen to me scream at you for an hour like a raving loon? No. You're supposed to just get through this so that you can go in the other room and encourage one another. That's what you're supposed to do. That's why it breaks my heart when people don't come because they should have been here. Not, they're hurting. They should be here so that Robert can encourage them. And if Robert's hurting, that dude should have been here to encourage his brother in Christ. And when people walk in, I don't know you, you walk in here and say, hey, you gave him his liver? Whoa, I want to be part of that family. That's crazy, right? That doesn't go on here. That doesn't go on here in this world. But when the world sees it, they're going to want in. They're going to want in. It's a love feast. It's a love feast. Now listen, that might sound good. But we've got to figure out how to do it. Every good team needs a game plan, right? Need a good game plan. Well, God is an awesome coach, amen? Ephesians chapter 4 tells us how to do it. He's so nice. We don't have to try to figure nothing out. It's perfect for stupid people like me. Ephesians 4, verse 16. Eight oh eight ish. Eight oh eight ish. You there, Jared? No, you're not. Ish. All right. Well, just listen up. I know you got it memorized. Listen. I know you got it memorized, but let me just say it for everybody else, okay? He makes, listen, we're supposed to, do, we're supposed to love on each other, right? God makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other, this is going to be an awesome place for an amen at the end of this one. Y'all ready? You're cocked and ready? Got it back? Are you ready? It helps, listen, everyone does their own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Listen, you know what this is telling us? If we want our church to be healthy, growing, and full of love, it cannot be full of love unless each one of us, that's everyone who calls revolution their family, does their part in the love feast. Yeah. Everyone has to do their part. You can't just leave it all up to Mary. She's a really good cook, but she'd probably like a break once in a while. Y'all could come in and help make the coffee. That's cool. You'd let them, wouldn't you? Yeah, I know she probably says, don't come in my kitchen. But she's just saying that to protect the coffee. She's just protecting the coffee because I love coffee. But you can help. Everyone does their own special part. Every single person. But look, you know what I love about this? He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. We're perfect. Not in and of ourselves, but the way we're put together, this crazy bunch, you're all nuts. It's a perfect little church, isn't it? We should rejoice in that. I'm learning. I'm learning. It's a good church. He fit us together perfectly. With all of our flaws and all of our failures, this is good. It's good. It's good, yeah. That wasn't good. Do I have any, any charismatic friends in here? There's a poster child community in the scriptures that displays just this attitude where everyone did their own special part so that the whole church was healthy, growing, and full of love. And it's proudly displayed in Acts chapter 4. And I'm just going to lead you to, to one little section of it. I want to read the whole book of Acts, but if you get a chance, you probably should read it. But in Acts chapter 4, verse 32 through 35, just three verses. I just want to read this because it's absolutely gorgeous, okay? 
It says this, all the believers. Now that's how many of them? All of them. So that's like each person does his own special part, right? So no one's dodging, no one's ducking. You can run, but you can't hide. All believers were united. That's the word, baby. Were united in heart and mind. That doesn't mean that they all agreed on every single thing that, that we should do. So when, the, when the, the leader of the church says, do something crazy, you go, what? Yeah, that's what you should do. Because when you're all doing what you do, the pastors of churches are supposed to be on their knees praying and asking for God's guidance. The pastor of churches are supposed to be having their face in the scriptures looking for the guidance of the Lord. And so when the, when the Lord says to, to Gideon, I want you to go around that city seven times tomorrow and then scream and the walls are going to fall down. What do you think his people said to him when he said, that's what we're going to do. Put your spears down. It worked though, didn't it? So when I ask you to do something crazy, just say, all right, you crazy loon, we'll do it. Here I am, send me, right? Just, 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 just do that, just do that, because that's what God will do sometimes, He'll tell you to do some crazy things. So we hear some, want to hear some crazy? Who wants to hear some crazy? Y'all want to hear some crazy? All the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned, now think about what you own right now. About it for a second. Meditate on it for a second. And they felt that what they owned was not their own. So they shared everything. Look at your neighbor and said, shared everything. They shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Listen up. And God's great blessing was upon them all. Amen. Yeah, don't miss that. You, you want God's great blessing upon you and, uh, and upon your church family, right? Amen. Right? I mean, come on, right? Yeah. We do, right? I do, I do, I do. I want that for you. I want that for you. Okay, well, he tells us how to get it. It's not, a, it's not a guessing game. Let's go back a second. They felt that what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all. They were preaching the word and they were living the word. There were no needy people among them. Because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. That's madness. Wait a minute. There's people here that are hurting? Oh, okay, well, why don't I sell my house? Oh, here's the $140,000 here. Just make sure that everyone eats. Look at the blank stares on y'all's faces like I'm insane. That's what they did. And they didn't pick and choose. Oh, I need to hold on to this money, make sure he's not going to drink with it. What did they do? They bring it to the apostles and they entrusted them, said, listen, you've been studying, you've been hearing from the Lord, you've been on your knees, I trust you. Here's my money, make sure you give it to someone who needs it. And they walk away, done. I don't even believe that this house is mine. God gave it to me, everything. And you know what? This Jesus, I watched him. He, he said all these things were going to happen, and then it did. He went to the cross, and then he died right before my eyes, and they put him in a grave, and then he just walked through that wall and said, go tell everyone about me. Let me give you some advice. If anyone walks through this wall and tells you to go do something, do it. Do you understand? Jesus walks through the wall and says, now I want you to go to the ends of the earth with the good news of me, make disciples, baptize them, and teach them all that I have taught you. Don't teach them to memorize it, y'all. Teach them to live it. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what we're supposed to do. <clears throat> okay, let's go back to our text for the, for the fourth and final point. We're supposed to love one another. It's active, it's active, and it's expressed in best in community. The last thing is that love should grow. Look back in our text here in verse 16. 
We know how much God loves us. He's not amazing. We know how much. Listen, how many of you know how much God loves you? And, and probably a lot of you won't raise your hand. I understand that. It's a tough one, right? Do you know? You know, the scriptures say when it talks about how deep and wide and long and wide, how, how God's love, it says that, that all sh believers should know how long and wide and deep. He wants you to know. But see, listen, you may be, you know that movie, uh, I think it's Rhinestone Cowboy, Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places. Don't make me sing that one too. Huh? Was that Urban Cowboy? I thought it was Rhinestone. Oh, that's a Rhinestone Cowboy. You're looking for love in all the wrong places. Listen, you know why they know how much he loved them? Here's, here's the word for you for tonight. You don't need to look anymore. The reason why they know is because God sent Jesus for them. That's it. You don't need to ask any more questions. Because Jesus came to save them, they know how much God loves them. Period. End of issue. Do you know that Jesus came to save you? Then he loves you. That's it. Okay, that's it. So let's, let's read here. God, uh, we know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. Now here's our last point. God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. Some of us, when we got saved, and myself included, some things just dropped away immediately. When I asked, I used to drink and smoke like a sailor. He knows, okay? And, but I asked God, take it away. Like, this was early on. Gone. I haven't had a drink or a cigarette in like 14 years, okay? No clap for me, but listen. Same spirit that lives in me lives in you. Okay, no more excuses, just ask them and put the stinking cigarettes down, all right? Listen, when I asked them to take it away, gone. Cussing? <laughs> we could start a symphony in here, I know that. I'm on Facebook, y'all. Mmm, some things. Trusting God? Over and over and over again, right? It's a process. You know, there's a great story, and I think it's in Matthew. And there's a guy that goes up to Jesus. He's got a sick son. And he says, uh, you want me to heal him? And the guy's like, well, yeah. And Jesus is like, do you believe I can? He goes, yeah, I believe. But help me with my unbelief. You know, we put bumper stickers and coffee cups that say, you know, I can do all things through Christ and God has great plans for me and all these great things. How about this one? That's our theme song, right? I mean, all of us. I believe. Help me with my unbelief. That means it's a process. Like, I'm, I'm here, but I want to get here. I want to trust you more. I want to I love you more. I want to lean on you more and believe in you more. <coughs> it's a process. And so what this tells us here, it says... As you live, as we, single and together community, as we live in God, as we live in God, as we are committed to praying, as we are committed to studying and wrestling in God's word and finding truth, as we're committed to fellowship together, to lean on each other, as we're submitting to spiritual authority that is leading us, as we live in God, as we're doing these things, our love grows more perfect. But you've got to be committed to doing those things. Now let me, off, let me ask you a question. This is, maybe it's just conjecture. I thought it was, but I'm going to say that it's truth. I, okay, this is this, I'm going to ask you a question. Don't just scream Jesus because it's church, okay? Think about it for a second before you scream out your answer. It says here that your love grows more perfect. Does that mean it grows bigger? Do you buy more presents? Do you put more money in the offering plate? What does this mean? What's the one and only thing? Think about it for a moment. Sing, person, whatever, ever, that's perfect. 
I didn't want you to scream it out. I wanted you to think about it. It's Jesus, right? Okay. So when it says, as we live in God, as we're committed to prayer and studying and fellowship and we're, and we're, we're, we're wrestling with the word of God and we're growing, as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. My offer to you is that our love becomes more like Jesus' love that was active, that was very active. I believe this to be true because I think that Romans 8, 29 is very clear that since the beginning, God's plan was that you would be conformed into the image of his son. You'd become more like Jesus. And I thought it was conjecture until the Lord put to my memory this verse from Jesus. Listen up. Jesus Christ says in John 15, 12, my commandment. Where's the, how much wiggle room do we have? Show me the sign. Zero, right? My commandment is that you love each other in the same way I have loved you. My commandment to you is that you love each other in the same way that I have loved you. Love in America is buying gifts and roses and jewelry. I love the Yankees. I love the weather. I love a good pint. Love is a flavor. Love is a food. Love is a feeling. And that's not love. Jesus Christ served, healed, comforted, fed, taught, and then he laid his life down for you. That's action. That's love. And that's the way we're supposed to love, just like Jesus. Love grows more perfect. Now listen, it tells us this is, this is a gift to you. Because there's some people that if you ask them if they're saved, if they're going to be in glory someday, they may have been going to church for 100 years and they cannot tell you with certainty whether they're in or they're out. Listen to this. It says that love grows more perfect, and it says that we will not be afraid of God on judgment day. One day, Jesus Christ is going to tear open the heavens, and he's going to come on a horse with a sword in his mouth and a tattoo on his leg and a robe with blood on it. Just rough and tough Jesus. This ain't no six pound, eight pound, six pound, eight ounce Jesus in the manger. This is a ferocious Jesus. He's coming down to judge people. And it says here that if you, it goes on to tell us that if you will, you will, um, if you will live like Jesus here and now, you can stand before him on the judgment day with confidence because you're living like him now. That's what it says. Y'all make think I'm making it up? Or should we read it? It says, let me let me read it to you here. All who confess that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them, and they live in God. We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in him. God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. That's where we left off. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. Now listen, it says perfect love expels all fear. And what's the fear that he's talking about here? It says, verse 18, such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. Listen, we know right then and there because of this statement of truth that if we live like Jesus, right, it demolishes the facade of fake love. It destroys the phony and it outs us all. And what I mean by that is it's, it gives us the gauge. Listen, if you're in the word and you're praying, you're asking the spirit to lead you and you're living like Jesus and you're loving like Jesus actively, you can look him in the eyes when he comes with confidence knowing that you're in. That's what it's saying. That's what it's saying because perfect love expels all fear. It tells us, am I in or am I out? Because I'm living like Jesus or I'm not. Bottom line, it's very simple. So we studied Jesus in the word of God. We saw how he taught. We saw what he did. And then we asked the spirit of the Lord to, to, to convict us and to lead us and to guide us to be like Jesus. And then we respond well, I hope, to that guidance. And then we rest in the assurance that if life, that if this life right here that's described in the scripture, that we're living like Jesus and loving like Jesus, which by the way is the same thing. If, we're, if that's us, well then I can face Jesus on judgment day with confidence. With confidence. 
So I'll close here. I'll ask you some questions. Are you living and loving more and more like Jesus? That, that's important. Are you loving like Jesus? Are you actively pursuing the hearts of your church family? Are, are you just saying I love you but I really don't like you enough to step into your world and offer myself to you? There have been people in this church that have been hurt and offended by our actions and I'm not mentioning names but I hope and pray and I have been that this message from God's word will encourage you to step back into the fray and make it right. We're to love one another. And when, listen, when people go on Facebook and see us loving on each other like a love feast, they will want to go to your church because it's uncommon. It's the truth. So, are you bringing a covered dish to the love feast here at Revolution? That's the question I have for you. Are you bringing, are you doing your part? Are you praying for one another? Are you encouraging one another? Are you helping one another? Are you motivating one another? Remember, love is active. Are you doing your part to help all the other parts grow so the whole church is healthy, growing, and full of love? Are you doing that? Is your love displayed? Is it active? Now this might sound crazy. I'll finish here. This might sound crazy, but since this text that we read tonight, I think it's very, very clear that it, it says that active, growing love within the community of faith indicates true sonship. Okay, so, so if that's the case, then some of, us, you, some of you might like introspect, look and self-examine yourself and say, you know what, that's not who I've been. But it's who I should be. And it's who I want to be. And, and listen, don't be ashamed. Because there's probably many of us just in this room alone that feel that way. That I haven't been that active participant who's just part of the love feast here at my church. Here at my church. Here at my church. Am I, part, am I doing my part so that the whole church is healthy, growing, and full of love? You may have gone to church for, for, for 20, 30 years, but you never became that person before. But let me encourage you with this last word. The scriptures say that by no means will Jesus ever deny anyone who comes to him. So it doesn't make any difference how long you've been going to church. If you want to become that person and you just want to shed off the old life of selfishness and greed and I can't step into their life because they offended me and I don't like their attitude and I don't like what they do and I don't like what they say. Listen, there's no room for that. God's love means you like people. God's love is not just a thought. It is not just an emotion. Don't shrink it down to that. God's love is an action. His love was displayed to you. And that's our call, to love one another as Christ loved us. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for uh, letting us get together here tonight. Thank you, Lord, for your, for your strong, yet your, your gracious and kind word. Thank you, Lord, above all else for loving us so much that you would send your son to die for us while we were yet sinners and lord i pray that right now that all of us here at revolution would would remember that 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 even though we didn't deserve it even though that we did the things that probably drove you crazy that you look past that and showed your love for us anyway there's not a person in this room that sought you out, deserved you, or even wanted you. But you invaded our space with your great love. And so the word of God tells us tonight that because you loved us that much, shouldn't we just love each other? Help us to love like you. Replace our idea of what love is, what it's been taught to us and change it and substitute it for the love that is found in your word and displayed in your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you.